All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 27th. Is it still the 27th? Yes, it is. <laughs> Day of October in the year of our Lord, 2022. Uh, a little different program right now or whatever. Is this a program? What? What happened here? Oh, I know what happened. I know what happened. Let's see. How... Uh, let's put it like about there. <laughs> uh, a little zoomed out here, but yeah, we had a power failure. It went off for about 30 seconds, and of course that shuts all the computers down. <laughs> all righty. Um, a little different um, issue, but let's start out with the word of the Lord. Yes, uh, this is election season. Just to remind everyone, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Yes, they will always betray you. Like they betrayed the Lord Jesus. All right, now, you know, they say hindsight's always much better than foresight, and that's true. And so in hindsight, looking back, in fact, actually, actually I was looking back quite a ways this morning. I, I find history fascinating. You travel, uh, explore certain rabbit trails in history, and you can learn a lot. It puts a whole different perspective as, as things flow down through the centuries. It turns out, you know, the Lord talks about, uh, as you sow, so shall you reap. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you? Well, I ran across a bit of historical trivia that's very informative. Uh, remember the Pearl Harbor incident? When the Japanese did the somewhat unintended sneak attack. You know, they were supposed to, their ambassador simply screwed up, was a bit incompetent, and didn't let the Americans know there was about to be an attack until after it already happened. Of course, that didn't help the Japanese at all. It just made everybody angry. Uh, now, it turns out, as I was looking this morning, I ran across some things, and I, I wanted, uh, for some reason, I looked at the the Japanese, the, uh, the Russo-Japanese War, the Russian-Japanese War that took place about 1905. And I was looking in that, my curiosity my something came to my mind as I was looking into some of the the information on that. Just curious, you know, and I recalled Admiral Perry. Admiral Perry didn't Admiral Perry have something to do with Japan? Yes, he did. You know, memory is a dangerous thing, <laughs> and they can't wipe our memory. You can wipe your computer hard drive. You can't wipe human memory very well without causing a lot of damage. Anyway, I was remember. So I looked up Perry in Japan. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. I remember now. Yeah, the United States decided they wanted to have trade relations with Japan. Japan was a closed country, sort of like North Korea. You know, they, were, they, they didn't want contacts with the outside world. The outside world was trouble. So they were sort of isolated, closed off. Um, a little bit, um, I'm not going to say backwards, different, <laughs> not modern, not technologically or technology oriented. So the United States wanted to expand its trade empire. Um, you, you need to perhaps look at what the United States has done over the years. You know, expanded the is is trade empire with Mexico. Remember how they did that? Seized half of Mexico. 
the entire southwest of the United States, invaded Mexico, sent the army down to Mexico City, and forced the Mexican government at gunpoint to sign a treaty giving the United States half their country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After deliberately provoking a war in Texas, but it wasn't really in Texas. It was in the Mexican state of Tejas, right down the Rio Grande River, which was never part of Texas. Oh, yes, uh, truth is a terrible thing. <laughs> It just persists. You can't get rid of it. You can lie and lie and lie, but the lies always fail and the truth stands. Uh, anyway, so what occurred to me was, uh, you know, that was about the same time as the American seizure of Texas, just slightly after. So they sent Admiral Perry over there with two American warships, which were utterly unlike anything the Japanese had. You know, they were still like the, in the uh, 17th century sort of um, and and they'd done quite well that way. And they weren't they didn't have a strong central government or anything at that time. It was sort of warlords, uh, semi autonomous or autonomous regions. So uh, they sent Admiral Perry in basically to to ask them to open up to, for trade or else. It's called gunboat diplomacy. You take your guns and you stick them in somebody's face and now you say, cooperate. It's it's also called the mob, mafia-style diplomacy. I'll make you an offer you can't refuse. That's exactly what America did. And it's very interesting that less than 100 years later, about 90 years later after that, Pearl Harbor happened. Well, what did America do? They, they, they opened up Japan. Japan looked, saw these weapons, these ships. We can't do anything about this. And the Japanese came to the conclusion that we're going to have to embrace modernism, we have to embrace Western technology and Western ideas, or they will simply swallow us whole. They will come in and just take our country like they've done others like India, for example, and good chunks of China. And so they did. Uh, by the end of the 19th century, or not even that far in, within... Um, it was about 10 years after that Perry got there, they really said, we're going to go this way. And by uh, nearer the end of the 19th century, they had fully industrialized, fully westernized, had a modern navy, very modern navy, with British-built, state-of-the-art battleships. And within a couple of years, like 1904 and 1905, they went to war with Russia because it, both of them wanted a good chunk of Manchuria, and control of Korea. And guess who won? The Japanese. Stomped the Russian Navy's butt. Uh, the Russian ships were older, and they had incompetent leadership, and, well, the Japanese stomped them. The Japanese paid a lot of... I had a lot of casualties on the ground war, but... Yeah, so... It didn't look good for Russia, though, really... In fact, it was one of the things that destabilized Russia that began to pave the way for the, uh, the communist revolution. It, actually, the first revolution wasn't communist, but the communists took advantage of it, a sky, uh, uh, hijacked it, and then it became the Soviet, socialist Soviet republics. Now, the communist revolution. So, uh, it's interesting. Say. The seeds the United States sowed with Admiral Perry cascaded into a lot of different things, including the communist revolution in Russia, the rise of Japan as uh, a imperial Pacific power. The, the, the it came to the events of Pearl Harbor, and is relevant today, especially in China. Uh, the United States also had people in there during the Boxer Rebellion, about the same time as the the Russian uh, Japanese War, early 1900s. There, uh, the, uh, the the Western nations, the Western empires, including the United States, uh, the United States just didn't have as big an empire as some of them, was busy trying to gobble up China. 
uh, trade concessions demanding uh, certain ports and areas be conceded to them for trade and commercial purposes to exploit the Chinese people. Uh, uh, England, in one of the most despicable acts in history, had previously gone to China, gone to war with China in something called the Opium Wars. Wars. Uh, India, uh, China was or China. No, England was supplying opium. They were selling opium in China. The Chinese government didn't like all their people becoming addicts, but it was making the British lots and lots of money. So they tried to stop the opium trade. The Chinese did. The Chinese government was banning the importation of opium. And what did the British do? They went to war and forced the Chinese government to allow them to continue peddling drugs, opium, to the Chinese people. And the Germans were doing the same thing. Oh, oh, not the drug thing, but in America was in China. You remember the Boxer Rebellion? There was a whole movie about it. Um, made, a, made the, 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 the Chinese into the villains. No, the West was the villains. They were the ones that were raping China. So the Japanese, the British, I think the French were there, the Italians might have been there, the Americans were there, and they were just, uh, the Germans, of course, were there. Uh, they were just looking to devour China, to, to use it as a part of their empires, and a, as a place for trade, uh, peddling drugs there, things like that. Yeah, really for the benefit of the Chinese, of course, because China was weak. And China has never forgotten that. And if you wonder what's going on in China today, it's not about communism. What, what, the, what is the whole deal about China and Taiwan, which is part of China? Taiwan was the last holdout. See, the, uh, when the Chinese communists during the Chinese Revolution defeated the nationalists, uh, who the United States was backing, the remnant of them fled to Formosa, now Taiwan, with American help. They were just evacuated. But that is part of China. They are Chinese people. It's just the last holdouts from the revolution. Uh, Hong Kong was basically an area seized at gunpoint, one of those trade concessions, to the British. The British controlled it. And you wonder why the Chinese used a bit of force to reincorporate Hong Kong under their unified political system because of the way the West treated China historically. They, they so, you know, it, it's a real, it's a festering sore in the memory of the Chinese. And the same as Taiwan, it's a festering sore for China. The, the way they were, they were disgraced by the West, the empires of the West, abused and treated as, you know, just commodity, uh, just terrible. Here, one of the oldest civilizations on earth, the ones who invented gunpowder, who invented the printing press, and they were treated like uh, less than human. Of course, the Japanese treated them less, like, as less than human, too. Quite literally, uh, the rape of Nanking. The Japanese were, you know, but again, who created the Japanese Empire? The United States did, really. We forced them to westernize, and they did with a passion, very thoroughly. And then they attacked the United States. Uh, we were getting a, two empires in conflict, both after the same resources and. The United States put sanctions. Did you know the United States put sanctions on Japan? We, we said, we're going to stop selling you oil, and we're going to stop selling you scrap metal. No more scrap steel from us. And that, that sort of pushed the Japanese over the edge. Roosevelt. <sighs> See, you don't suppose that people could ever act, act like Christians and, and try to you know, rather than trying to force the Japanese to become a, like Americans, 
predatory capitalists. They could have gone and shared the gospel with them. As, you know, gone there, preferably Japanese people, and lived like Japanese, but shared the gospel of Jesus Christ, completely removed from America, uh, which is a terrible thing that missionaries have done. They have, they have, uh, especially the British, they brought Christianity t attached to their colonial empire and their ways of doing things. Uh, back in the 60s, maybe in the early 70s, American missionaries to Central America, uh, a number of them were actually in cahoots with the CIA. They were supposedly preaching Jesus Christ, but they were actually functioning as agents of the CIA at the same time. Now, when you go to another country in the name of Christ, you leave your country and any loyalty to that behind, or you are not a servant of Jesus Christ. That's despicable. Absolutely despicable. Treason to the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, you're, I'm, you're, I'm preaching the gospel, but I got this little side deal going with the CIA, and they fund me and everything else. I just have to feed information to them and maybe put a bug in certain people's ears. You know, suggests they do things like rebel against the government or something. That's 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 terrible. So fast forward things a little bit, and uh, so what's going on now? I was thinking back, and and in Iran right now, we, we've heard of these riots. First, it was protests. First, it was fall apparently false reports about a a young woman who was arrested by the morality police for not having her scarf on properly or something. And, <clears throat> of course, you would never ever have, even think about morality police in America because there is no such thing. No, there'd be police out there enforcing abor abortions and enforcing sex change and things like that in the United States. You know, Biden, Biden's moral immorality police Yes, you must worship Molech, uh, which is what Biden apparently worships. Anyway, the uh, in Iran right now, those there was false reports coming through American media and everything else, spreading over social media. There's something going on with social media in the American government. Uh, the American government has weaponized it, I suspect, and has probably weaponized Starlink. We know he has. They have in in. Uh, Ukraine. But it went from a woman who had been arrested, there was video released of her in the police station, in the lobby, waiting for booking or whatever it was, and she suddenly falls over. And then a day or two later dies. Uh, cerebral anoxia. There was no evidence of beating or anything. But somebody started spreading all kinds of rumors via social media and the internet that she had been beaten to death by the Iranian police. And then there were protests. And then, then those protests quickly evolved into riots. Do you think anybody could be responsible for that? Could it be the same country who overthrew the lawfully elected democratic government of Iran back in, was it 1953? The government of Mossadegh? Because British Petroleum didn't like the people, the, the government of Iran wanting a larger a royalty for the oil they were sucking out of the Iranian soil. So they got the CIA, the, Brit the British government, and then the CIA to arrange a coup to overthrow that and installed the Shah of Iran, the notorious Shah of Iran with his notorious Savak secret police. And of course, then the Iranian people finally rose up because of a cleric who was distributing tapes on cassettes, Ayatollah Khomeini, Khomeini, or Khomeini, I can't remember how it's, his, there's so many that sound alike over there, uh, for, to me. But what happened? Again, it was a result of America meddling in other countries' business. 
America choosing to support the empires. Oh, there are buddies that were going to support Britain against the people of Iran. Same as in Vietnam. The French were trying to retake their colonies in Indonesia, or excuse me, Indochina, like Vietnam. Now, those countries, they, they had been taken from England, and, or the French, the French, uh, by the Japanese. And then when then those countries rose up at the end of the war and basically fought against the Japanese that were still there and expelled them, there was a whole bunch of bloody wars against colonies down there. In Indonesia, the Dutch were a ruthless, wicked people and slaughtered all kind of in Indonesians. See, all this stuff comes back and bites you. And America was always supporting the wrong side. Supported the French in trying to reconquest, conquer uh, French uh, Indochina. Well, the, the Vietnamese didn't want it. Say, we, we had enough trouble getting with the Japanese. We don't want this French back here. This isn't their country. We should have sided with Ho Chi Minh against the French. Oh, no, we had to support the French, especially after got, they got their tail kicked out at, uh, what was the name of that? I uh, can't remember the battle. Yeah, the, 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 the Vietnamese beat the French. Somebody knows. Somebody else out there remembers that name of that. I can't remember it right now, but yes. So we go in and and take over where the French left off, and impose a American puppet government in South Vietnam. We the Americans didn't allow a free election in Vietnam. The Americans didn't because they knew that they would lose it. You know, this whole domino theory that came from, from President Eisenhower, that if we allow this one country to fall, they'll all fall. Ho Chi Minh was more of a patriotic movement, an independence movement, than a communist movement. America could have made a better choice, and things would have been different, just like forcing Japan to open up. <laughs> yep, it comes back to bite you. Now... What's going on today? Well, in Iran, it looks to me like the the force, the dark deep state, the, the CIA and operatives like that, NGOs, which is the privatized deep state that works to over like Soros that works to overthrow other other governments, uh, is trying a, to set up a revolution in Iran again. How many times have they tried that recently? And it all it does is get people imprisoned, beaten, and some people dead. Trying to uh, set up a revolution. Use Iranians as pawns because they don't like Iran. Because America can't get along with anybody that, that disagrees with them, apparently. Anyway, we have a number of things going on there. It's, I saw that. Oh boy, this smells like CIA again. How many times have they done this now? There, in, in the Middle East, in the Far East, in Central and South America, it's just been one long, continuous history of evil. But, of course, we're not supposed to remember those things. We're supposed to memory hold it like everything else, like COVID and where originated. It's interesting, the pieces of that puzzle are coming together, too. Remember, uh, Rand Paul has exposed a, a number of things on the Senate floor, including the American funding, CDC or FDA, indirectly through a secondary firm, and then contracting gain-of-function research on coronaviruses, bat viruses, to a Chinese lab, at least one, on the Senate floor. And we have Fuji deny, oh, we did not do gain of function. No, not in the United States, but because it was illegal in the United States to do that research. So what did they do? Obey the law or outsource it to a Chinese lab. 
And the way the Chinese military reacted to this indicates they didn't know what was going on there. I wonder what goes on behind, you know, the back channel communication. I'm sure the Chinese know what was going on there now. I'm sure they're keeping a tab on things. So, gain-of-function research in China. Chinese lab on bat viruses. And it, more and more scientists in various places, and some of the original scientists that looked, looked at it, but was this report, this idea was suppressed by Dr. Fauci. That's all out in the public. That it appeared to them then, and to a number of more scientists now, that it was a synthetic virus. It was spliced to add a function to it. Gain of function. A function that makes it infectious in humans. The function that adds the spike program, uh, protein that interacts with your blood pressure control system. The har hormones that control your blood pressure. It goes, it, it's a, uh, the protein of virus, it's a key. And it goes into a, a slot designed for a particular enzyme that affects your blood pressure and it controls your blood pressure. And so the virus uses a key that goes in that slot that unlocks it, allows the virus to insert itself into your cell. Now, those are very specific things, those proteins. They function like a key. A bat virus, it could have that kind of effect on a bat, but it will not infect a human because the key doesn't match. Well, somebody spliced things together to make a, a wild virus infective of human beings. Maybe they were just playing around to see what it would do, and it got loose. Maybe somebody at the lab got accidentally infected, probably didn't tell anybody because, you know, exposed themselves, but because if they find out, I'm going to be quarantined for nine months, and, you know, so, mm. and then they go out, and it becomes loose out in the Chinese city. That is probably what happened. That is a reasonable scenario. And anybody that says that's not a possibility is nuts. Certainly is a possibility. It fits the facts we know. There's other possibilities. A, a, a wild virus could have spontaneously mutated into a form that infects human beings. Now, a lot of viruses do emerge in China because of the high population density, and especially in the agricultural areas, Human beings are in close contact with farm animals, like uh, ch chickens, turkeys, uh, ducks, things like that. And when you have human beings, or swine, pigs, when you have human beings in intimate contact over long periods of time with, with, with animals, especially sometimes they might even live in the house, which they used to do in the American frontier all the time, by the way. So don't think it's weird, you know. You got animals that give off heat, and it's cold. You bring these four-legged portable heaters in the house. Keeps them warm and keeps you warm too. Just so you think the Chinese aren't some really crude barbarians. No, it was done in America all the time. We still do it. I've got a dog. <laughs> okay, not quite the same thing, but you know, you got close proximity. Um, you can get a virus jump species, but it, it's difficult. It has to be in like two different species. Things are infecting the cell at the same time, and they they somehow manage to merge in the transcription. It's possible, but not very likely. A completely wild, random mutation out in the wilderness that suddenly becomes infective is almost possibility is almost zero. I'm not an expert. I just know a little bit about mathematics and science. 
And I can understand these things a bit. I mean, these are the kind of things you can do in your basement. Just buy some equipment off eBay. Do it in a high school lab. They do genetic um, modification all the time in high school labs with E. coli. I remember some of the things I did in the high school lab. It wasn't that, but, you know, high school students, they might just do something silly, thinking it's silly. And anyway, it's, it's dangerous technology, very dangerous technology. But, what, you know, if you have the American government people in the American government, I'm, this isn't an official thing. You've got individuals that want to play around with something. It's illegal in the United States, so they outsource it to a lab someplace else that's willing to do it. That's probably what happened. And that's what Rand Paul was exposing on the Senate floor. The American funding this stuff, gain-of-function research. And Fauci said, oh, no, oh, no, that's not gain-of-function. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. He's just denying because he's guilty. Like, me thinks you protest too much. And now, you know, who's going to actually investigate him? Nobody wants to investigate it. Why? Because this stuff was approved by the United States government. It was approved by the Congress. doesn't matter. They don't read the paper, the things they sign anyway. But they have their hands in it, too, because it was funded. The money for this came by a congressional uh, authorization. That's where all the money comes from. So why, why was the United States military, the Pentagon, funding and working collaboratively with 46 bio labs in Ukraine? Perfect, for, only for my own opinion. What do I know? I know nothing. I see nothing. I hear nothing. That's a story I'm going to stick to. Uh, no, no. Why? Why would they do this? They say, oh, I was just to monitor health conditions. Why would the Pentagon be in the business of funding and contracting or cooperating somehow with 46 labs in Ukraine, the country the United States had overthrown the government in in a coup in 2014? The Maidan protests suddenly became a coup led by the Bonderistas with their racist ideology. Now, John McCain was over there in person cheering this thing on. Victoria Nuland was in there handing out cookies. Literally. The, I mean, the, the photos are out there. They were cheering this on. Overthrow the Ukrainian government. Why? Because it was on the Chinese, it was on the Russian border. Okay, after they overthrew this and put in a puppet government, which is what it is, it's a puppet government funded by the United States and NATO, armed, trained by the United States and NATO. NATO is the United States. The United States and its vassal client states army that don't really contribute much of anything. It just allows the United States to say, well, it's not us, it's NATO. Yeah. Why would they be doing this? Are they just interested in the health of the Ukrainian people? <laughs> well, they're sending them tons and tons and tons of weapons and getting them killed by the hundreds of thousands right now. It doesn't sound like they're really interested in the health of the Ukrainian people. Otherwise, they would have not allowed this war to get going. They wouldn't, have, they wouldn't have provoked Russia like they did. Deliberate provocation. Just like the Americans deliberately provoked the Mexican government to respond to an invasion by the, a small detachment of American soldiers in Texas, Tejas, right across from uh, Matamoros, right in the river, in Mexican territory. Set up a fort right across the river from Matamoros, and, of course, the commander there had to do something, so he sent out a little uh, a squad of troops to go reconnoiter and see what's going on on the other side of the river. And they bumped into an American patrol, and there was a couple shots fired. 
And the next thing you know, the United States declares war on Mexico. Those terrible Mexicans, they, they took a shot at one of our soldiers who was in Mexico there to provoke a conflict. Truth, absolute truth. Been to the battlefield. Oh, d dirty. I mean, not to mention what they did to, well, like Sandy Creek, the American Indians. Uh, Custer got exactly what he had coming. Arrogance. But it didn't fare. That battle didn't actually help the American Indian cause at all. Okay. Um, if they were in the way, they were in the way. They had to be gotten rid of. The American genocide of the Native Americans. It's true. It's true. They were put on... Hitler, in fact said he got the inspiration for concentration camps from how the Americans handled the Native Americans. Reservations. Terrible history. So what would those Pentagon-funded and supervised, apparently, biolabs in Ukraine have been about the health of the Ukrainian people? Really? That's what the Pentagon's empowered to do? Go around the world and as health workers? I don't think so. So what would they have been doing in Ukraine? This is where it gets really scary. There, there is a reason. Why would they be interested in doing genetic viral experiments with the Ukrainian people using Ukrainian volunteers and other things. Why would they be interested in taking DNA samples of Ukrainians? Because Ukrainians are Russians. They're the same people. They're not a separate nation. <laughs> They're not. Uh, Russia originated as, as the and Ukraine, as which was no nation forever, that was never a nation except for a few short years after World War I. The Kievan Rus people, Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. So in that general area of North Ukraine, southern Russia there, was where the original Russian people, Prince Vladimir, the who uh, became and converted his people to Christianity about, what, 900-something, 980-ish. That's the origin. So why would the, the American military be interested in DNA and pathogens in that area? Selective biological weapons. This, as far as I know, this is only theoretical. But theoretically, it would be possible to engineer a bioweapon to be racially selective. Think of sickle cell, a uh, African American genetic thing. I don't think that's an infective agent. But obviously, from COVID 19, there, there's a certain amount of variation. Uh, um, with different peoples. Some of that's environmental, how crowded they are. But, for example, African Americans seem to have been much more susceptible to it than some other people. And there are some areas in the world that was, um, I think the Middle East actually had very low fatality rates compared to others. So for certain agents, it's just like uh, the bubonic plague, there is a genetic variation so that the bubonic plague uh, affects certain populations, but if you have this variant, it doesn't tend to affect you. So you could, it's theoretically possible, to have a, a, a biological pathogen that is racially selective. Do you understand what you could do? So if you did that, if you could find out an agent that would be infective to, say, the Slavic people, 
the Kiev, Kievan Rus that would be relatively benign to others. And you released, see, an agent like that, you could release it in a surreptitious manner. You know, just have somebody fly into airports or infect them, and, and they could just spread it around, just like COVID-19 did. COVID-19 was exceedingly infective, exceedingly. It's like four or five times more infective than the flu. That was the original one, and then it self-mutated into even more virulent forms. Uh, and forms that would get around vaccines and and masking. See, once you got a big po- uh, colony, a big population of a virus, there are always going to be mutations. And if you got a huge population out there mutating all the time, and you try to re- to come up with preventative measures, you'll simply create a lot of mutations. You get around your preventative measures. That they'll be more effective, so masking doesn't do anything. Or they'll be, uh, they become these. It'll select out the ones that are resistant to vaccine, to the particular vaccine that's, or antibodies that are out there now. That's just the way uh, viruses are. So you don't you don't put out vaccines in the middle of a pandemic. No, and they, they were warned about that. They were warned about that. They don't listen. After all, all these people in Congress and everything are so brilliant, and in the CDC. Anyway, I I suspect that that's why there was 46 labs there. It doesn't mean that they were actively developing a weapon. But the only reason that there was something there like that was they would be gathering information so they could. You know, there is, America does have bioweapon labs. Fort Detrick, Virginia, is a biological lab, I believe run by the Army, it used to be at least. Probably still there. These things are supposed to all be banned, by the way. But uh, they, they operate under the guise of research in case somebody else uses them. So we have methods. So they'll create these pathogens, these bioweapons, under the, uh, 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 under the idea under the the smoke screen of we're creating these things because somebody else might create the thing and use it on us. Well, the the idea that you'd both create the same bioweapon is absurd. The same genetically engineered bioweapon? No. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. So, again, I think the Chinese lab was a way to make an end run around American law. I heard heard, heard that uh, Barack Obama had banned gain-of-function research. So apparently certain people didn't like that because they had some experiments they wanted to do, so they simply outsourced it to China. If that's true, and the Chinese probably would have uncovered it since they had their hands on all the people that worked on the lab, at the lab, and all the information that was in the lab... You sort of wonder, could that affect the Chinese attitude toward the United States government? They did. Originally, they blamed the United States. They said it was an American government thing, a plot. Perhaps it was. And more likely to be outsourced in an accident. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, Deliberately doing this to China would be... Well, if somebody ever did that, they should be punished to the fullest extent possible. Slowly. It's like, whoever blew up those gas pipelines in the Baltic Sea, they, they should be publicly tried and publicly executed. Because people are going to die from that. This winter, people are going to die. Others will commit suicide. Others will lose everything they have because the price of heat and electricity has gone through the roof in Europe. Why? Because of American sanctions. 
the stupid Europeans have to follow America. They're gutless leaders. Don't have the guts to tell Joe Biden to go stick it. To take a jump off the pier. If you can't stand up to Joe Biden, what are you? Huh. Anyway, uh, that appears to be what's going on. I mean, those, those bio labs, they had a purpose. And they weren't the health of the Ukrainian people. Because the United States wouldn't be uh, shipping hundreds of tons of weapons in there, getting them all killed. Because they know they're going to lose. That's not the object. Just like why did the United States shove all those weapons into Afghanistan? Because they cared for the, the political freedom of the Afghan people? They, never, they were never a democracy. They knew what happens in Afghanistan. But God, you know, as you sow, so shall you reap. America tried to destroy, bleed the Russians to death in Afghanistan, and were relatively successful. That was part of the cause of the fall of communism, the collapse. The Russians simply didn't have an unlimited economy. Just plus Star Wars, that whole Star Wars scam, just to bleed the Russian economy to death. It was the same thing they just tried to do earlier this year with the sanctions. Seizing $300 billion, if they actually got that much, just, just trying to destroy Russia. Well, you think the Russians aren't keeping track of those things? So what happened in Afghanistan? America got involved there. What happened to America? Got, got beat. We were beat. We were beat in Afghanistan, just like every other empire that's ever invaded Afghanistan. You know, it's, it's sad that Afghanistan is where empires go to die. The British, they tried to, to control Afghanistan. <laughs> they were always beat. You can't win there. As long as you go up with people that will not stop fighting. It's holy war. We got beat in Vietnam. Thoroughly. Thoroughly. And we deserved it because we supported the French. America supported the French. The French Empire. Why? Why? Foolish. Foolish. Anyway, that's... Uh, don't believe what's on American media. But, oh, I know what I was going to say. It, I think the, uh, the American government is weaponizing or has weaponized uh, social media. And they've also got their fingers deep into uh, Elon Musk and, and his Starlink and other things. See, there's lots of government and SpaceX. I mean, uh, SpaceX is, America, is America's space program now. Uh, <clears throat> privatized. The government has lots of contracts. So they've got huge levers on Musk. Plus, what happened, though, the other day I noticed, yesterday I think it was, a story about the Justice Department uh, filing charges, their criminal charges against Tesla, something to do with their, their self-driving vehicles. J just after... Elon Musk happened to be making some comments on, on social media about perhaps a peace pr a plan for Ukraine. American government doesn't want peace. It shot down every opportunity for peace it could. Along with England, it wants to bleed Russia, just like it did in Afghanistan. Have a client state, a hostile client state, on the Russian border. Get access to the North Sea, or not the North Sea, the Black Sea. You know, put American military power in the Black Sea, in Ukraine. Well, why don't we just put some ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads in Ukraine, too, just like we did in Turkey that led up to the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
You didn't know that, right? America put Jupiter ballistic missiles in Turkey that could reach Moscow. Flight time's important because that's how long you got to think before you get blown up. Do you launch on warning or do you have a few mi minutes or 10 minutes to think about what's going on? Realize how dangerous this is. No, you don't. You don't. Not unless you know about it. You don't know. I was in the Air Force. Warning time was at max 20 minutes. And that's if they were launched from Russia, not from a, a ballistic missile submarine in the Gulf of Mexico or something. No, that was if they were launched from Russia. We had 20 minutes maximum. So you got 20 minutes to try to figure out what's going on, if it's real, uh, if the information is accurate, where are they headed, and then how you're going to respond. What happens if you only got five minutes? Like if you put the missiles on the Russian border. What are the Russians supposed to do? They have to fire on warning. And you can get false warnings. I know for a fact there has been false warnings at NORAD. Accidents. Technician puts the wrong tape in the machine and sends out a launch order rather than a test message. Almost went to nuclear war because somebody put the wrong tape in the machine that sent out the alerts. It was on magnetic tape. It looked like 35 millimeter film back then. The military doesn't have the latest technology. No. But because somebody picked up, he probably took the one he'd put taken out of the machine set it aside, had the test tape there, accidentally picked up the real tape, put it in the machine, sent the message. It was a launch order or an alert. I don't know the details. I wasn't there when it happened, but I was told about it. From inside the military. <laughs> From SAC. Yeah, I was, I'd worked in those areas that those orders went out from, and where they got the orders, in the missile silos, and at the B-52 sites. you got to have the time, and you got to have people in the loop who can say, no, wait. People that real have some moral background, moral spine that will say, no, we are not going to destroy the world. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. We have people in power in the United States who are the epitome of evil. They have no moral conscience. They are hollow people, controlled by their master, Satan. Do not put your trust in men, and do not put your trust in princes. Do not think the Republicans are much different. They are mercenaries just like the Democrats. They serve their own interests, not the interests of the American people, and they certainly don't serve God. But if you're a Christian, you have access to the very throne of God. Personally, I don't quite know what to pray for, because obviously God's judgment is on the West and the United States. He has given this country and Europe and Australia, and Canada, over to vile affections and a reprobate mind. That is a 
obvious fact. So it is already the wrath of God is upon the Western world. How do you pray for a people that God has decided to destroy? 9-11, there was a brief period of repentance. Then after that, nothing. COVID struck, no repentance at all. Churches were closed, no repentance. People go back to church and they're worse than ever. The churches are worse than ever. What does that say? The restraining one is gone, taken out of the midst. God is allowing sin to run its course because judgment, the king and the judge, is at the very doors. It will proceed the way it's going until he returns and stops it. You understand what's going on. If you're Christian, cling to Christ. Trust in him, not in man, and not in princes. Don't be a fool. Cling to Christ. He is our hope. He is our life. And he is our salvation.